Welcome, friends, to Smyrna Gospel Ministries' presentation of the Bible study series, The Good News About God. Featuring speakers, Pastor Alan Stump of Smyrna Gospel Ministries, Brother Linford Beachy, also of Smyrna Gospel Ministries, and special guest speaker, Pastor David Clayton of Restoration Ministries, Jamaica, West Indies. And now, the host of the series, Pastor Alan Stump. Hello there. I'm Alan Stump with Smyrna Gospel Ministries. Welcome to this presentation in the Bible study series, The Good News About God. We've produced this series to expose the most deceitful errors that Satan has sought to promote and to clarify the wonderful truth about the being the Bible calls God. We believe that, like our Savior, we're in this world to do service for God. We're here to become like God in character and by a life of service to reveal Him to the world. But brothers and sisters, in order to be co-workers with God, in order to become like Him and to reveal His character, we must have a proper understanding of Him. We must know God as He reveals Himself. You see, it's the knowledge of God alone that can make us like Him in character. This knowledge is the essential preparation both for this life and for the life to come. In his second epistle, the Apostle Peter in chapter 1 and verse 3 says that through a knowledge of Him are given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. And our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, declared, This is life eternal, that they might know Thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom Thou hast sent. Friends, this is the knowledge which God is inviting you to receive, and beside which all else is vanity. May God bless you as you carefully study the following presentation. Good day, brothers and sisters. I want to say welcome to our presentation. Today I'm going to talk about the Holy Spirit and as soon as I mention the Holy Spirit, right away I know that there are some people who are going to get a bit nervous perhaps, a bit edgy, because the subject of the Holy Spirit has become in many circles a very controversial subject, perhaps even volatile. You know, I, I have discussed this subject with some people who, are, who have cautioned me, be careful that you don't commit the unpardonable sin. And yet I believe that the subject of the Holy Spirit is something that we need to discuss, something we need to understand. I have learned since I became a Christian, it has been enforced on my mind more and more forcefully that understanding what God says about himself is very important, that worshiping God in spirit and in truth is critical to the Christian's experience. I mean, God wants us to worship Him not just like the heathen worship Him, not in ignorance and darkness. And the entire Bible is an attempt of our Father to help us to understand who He is that we might serve Him aright. Because I want to tell you, we cannot reveal God's glory. We cannot reveal him to the world. We cannot demonstrate the kind of person God is. His purposes in us cannot be fulfilled if we have false concepts about God, especially when God has revealed very clearly in his word what he is, who he is, what we should believe. And that is why today we come again to the subject of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's, it, it's, it is interesting to me how much tradition can influence the way people think. And perhaps in no other area of Christian belief is this more forcefully brought out than in the, su in the subject of the Holy Spirit. Normally, when we think of the word spirit, when we use the word spirit in human terminology, people don't have a difficulty in understanding what we mean. There are no misconceptions. If I were to say to you, I feel heaviness in my spirit, or I feel wounded in my spirit, I don't think there is one person in a million 
who would misunderstand what I mean. But somehow when we say holy, when the word holy is used in front of the word spirit, suddenly the word takes on a new meaning. And I believe many people come to the Bible with this kind of preconceived ideas, with this kind of sort of sort of different attitude when, 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 when it comes to the term Holy Spirit. This preconceived idea which has come to us over the centuries. And so, as soon as the term Holy Spirit is used, all of a sudden the, the word spirit no longer means spirit. It takes on a different meaning. I just want to read for you very quickly from Webster's New World Dictionary. The common understanding of the word spirit and logically when we come to the Bible every place that we see spirit we should reasonably first of all apply these definitions well first of all it says that the the first meaning of spirit and I think we can all agree with this because this is what the word means basically in 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 in, in our language when we use the word spirit it says first of all it is the life principle especially in man Originally regarded as inherent in the breath or as infused by a deity. It could also be the soul. So that's the first definition. It is a life principle, especially in man. Secondly, we are told that it is the thinking, motivating, feeling part of man, often as distinguished from the body, the mind, or the intelligence. And thirdly, it is the life the will, the conscious, uh, consciousness, the thought, and so on, regarded as separate from matter. These are the first three definitions of the word spirit. And all of us can empathize with that because this is exactly what we mean when we talk about spirit. If somebody says, if somebody says, my spirit is in agreement with your spirit, what we mean simply is that my mind, my thoughts, my outlook is the same as yours. And there are some other definitions, one or two other, other meanings that are given here. But these are the first three definitions. And, and, and this is basically what we understand when we talk about spirit. The Bible teaches us that man was made in the image of God. And I think this is an important principle that we need to understand as we approach this study of the Holy Spirit. Nobody is in any, in any question or controversy, or at least... Hardly anybody is in any question when we talk about the spirit of man. And I believe the Bible establishes an important principle that we will look at first of all that helps us to understand what is the spirit of God. In Genesis 1 and verse 26, the Bible says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Here we are told that man was made in the image of God. And I suppose one of the things that I, that I, I questioned as, uh, from, from maybe, maybe very early in my life when I read this verse, and I know that many people do ask the same question. The question was, what did it mean when it says that God made man in his likeness. Does it mean that God has a body like mine? Or does it mean that God's mind, his outlook, his thoughts are similar to mine? Well, that is a question that I've heard many times. Well, interestingly, uh, I, I read Ellen G. White suggests that God made man not only in his mental likeness, not only in his physical likeness, but also in his spiritual likeness. In the book, Education, on page 15, we read, When Adam came from the Creator's hand, he bore in his physical, mental, and spiritual nature a likeness to his Maker. God created man in his own image. And it was his purpose that the longer man lived, the more fully he should reveal this image, the more fully reflect the glory of the Creator. All his faculties were capable of development. Their capacity and vigor were continually to increase. 
So here we are told that man was made not just in God's physical image, but in God's spiritual image. Man was the counterpart of God. Granted, on a small scale, but at the same time, on a true scale, a true representation of God. What does it mean to say that man was made in God's physical image? Well, of course, it means that he has hands. God has hands. He has a head. God has a head. When you look at man, you could see what God looks like in, his, in, 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 in terms of what was visible to the eyes. But also man was made in the spiritual image of God. What does that mean? I think it should be obvious to anybody who is a reasonable, honest thinker that it must mean that as, as man has a spirit, so God has a spirit. Or to put it in the true order, as God has a spirit, so man also has a spirit. Now I know that there are some Christians, and especially if you're a Seventh-day Adventist, and if you have my kind of background, you know, or you were probably taught that the spirit in man that the Bible speaks about is simply the breath. The thing that we breathe in and out. I mean, I, I had a debate with an Adventist minister not too long ago, perhaps a couple of years, in which, uh, let me say a discussion rather than a debate, in which he was insisting that all man was composed of was the body and breath. And that when you stop breathing, you die. Therefore, the breath is the spirit. And somehow I just could not get this man to understand that the spirit is more than simply breath. I had problems with this when I was when I was a young Christian because that is what I was taught. I had problems because I couldn't understand if I were to die how it was that I would come back in the resurrection because in my mind to my understanding when I die my body would rot the particles of matter would be dissipated some they would return to the molecules and atoms from which I was originally formed and that these molecules and atoms would be scattered far and wide. It could happen that somebody was to, to, to drown and be eaten by fish, or he could die in the desert and return to dust, and the wind would blow this dust all over the place. And yet when a person dies, the Bible says that he shall come back again in the resurrection. When I asked, when I asked some people, how am I going to come back? When I asked people who should know the answer I got was that God will, God is able to bring back your thoughts. God is able to bring back somebody just like you. And this worried me more than before. Because, of course, I didn't want my twin brother to come back. I myself, this person, this identity, I wanted to come back. I mean, how comforting is the thought that when I die, somebody like me is going to come back. And so the question in my mind was, what component of my being, my existence, is preserved. There must be some component if I am to come back. And that component is what constitutes me, my identity. That is David. I'm going to have a new body in the, re in the resurrection. So, if the body is all that I am, how is it that I shall come back if my body is going to be new? And thankfully I found that the Bible gives a very clear answer. In Job 32 and verse 8, the Word of God says, But there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. There is a spirit in man. There is something inside of man that is spirit. In Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7, the wise man says, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was. When a man dies, the body returns to dust as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. That is very clear. There are two components to, to, to man. One part is body, one part is spirit. When a man dies, the body returns to dust, but the spirit is preserved by God. And, and this thought comes out so many times in the Bible. This same truth that it, it is not easy to lose your way and become confused unless you are blinded by the eyes of tradition. Look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5 and verses 3 to 5. 
He says, For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Two components, the flesh will be destroyed, that the spirit may be saved. That's very plain. In Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 21, again Solomon says, Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? Now think about that. If all that the spirit is, is the breath, does it make sense to say that when a man dies, his breath, the air that he breathes, go goes up? And, and, and when an animal dies, when a beast dies, the breath that he breathes goes down? It doesn't make sense. This is talking about something else. There is some part of man. And I just want you to understand that I'm not suggesting that when a man dies, this spirit as a conscious entity can walk around, you know, like some people believe in ghosts. That when a man dies, his spirit can get up and walk around the place and appear to people and bring messages to people. This is spiritualism because the Bible teaches that when a man dies, he goes to his long sleep. That they shall not be awakened until the resurrection. That the dead know nothing. The fact is that though a man's spirit continues to exist after he dies, yet it exists in an unconscious state. It is not capable of thought, of activity without the body. You know, many years ago I heard an illustration that I want to share with you. And I thought when I read this illustration that this was the best illustration that I had ever heard of what the spirit is and how it operates. The person compared the spirit and the body of man to a tape recorder and the cassette, the, the tape itself. The, the body would represent the tape recorder while the spirit would represent the cassette that is inserted into that tape recorder. Now, you, if you put a blank cassette into a tape recorder, you can record many things on that tape. Music, thoughts, sermons, ideas. The tape becomes a faithful record of your thoughts and your ideas. What good is that tape if you remove it from the tape recorder. Can it function? Can it work? Can you hear the music or, or the thoughts that you recorded there? No. To all intents and purposes, that tape is dead. Without the tape recorder, without the body, this tape is dead. It, it, it is no good. And yet it can, it can be preserved. It can preserve those thoughts and ideas for many years. In fact, you can actually insert that tape into a new tape recorder, perhaps one of higher quality, and the same thing that was placed on that tape will be played again. This is a very good illustration of what the human spirit is like. From the moment we are born, we begin to record thoughts, ideas, we begin to de develop a character on something called our mind. Many years ago when I was in, in college, my psychology teacher told me that even the evolutionary, even people who believe in evolution are, are compelled to admit that there is a component in human beings that they, they, they call mind, that they cannot define. He says if you look at the brain of a human being and compare it to the brain of an animal, he says there is very little difference. It is, it is, it is impossible to discern what the main differences are between an animal's brain let us see a highly developed animal and a human being. He says, this thing that is called mind or character, there is a, a quantum leap between dumb animals and human beings. And it cannot, be, it cannot be explained simply by the structure of the brain. He says, there is something that is, is evident 
that there is some component and it is not in the brain it is it, it's not the brain and it's not the body and what it is we can only call it the mind or the spirit some people refer to it as a psyche there is some component in humanity that is more than simply physical and this is what the bible is talking about when it says the spirit this spirit is preserved when a man dies and in the resurrection, God puts that same spirit or character in a new body. To, to, to follow up the idea of the illustration, he puts the tape in a new tape recorder of, of a far higher quality. And, and when he plays back that record, that tape, the quality of the character is, is better. The music is in stereo. The quality is much better, but it is the same exact thing that was recorded there and that is why in the resurrection we shall come back with our same characters our same identity thank god it will not be my twin brother who comes up in the resurrection it will be me i myself shall see the face of jesus thank god and this thought is brought out over and over in luke 1 and verse 80 when it speaks about jesus it says that the child grew and waxed strong in spirit this does not mean that his body was developing, although it was. But it's speaking about an internal development. He waxed strong in spirit. Now, the, 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 the important thing about all of this that we have just looked at is to recognize that man was made in the image of God. And if you can understand what man's spirit is, then we should be able to take a step from there to understand better what God's spirit is because the Bible makes it clear that God has a spirit just as man has a spirit but somehow we you know it, it is strange that as soon as you talk about God's spirit something strange happens in people's minds tradition takes over and they believe that when you speak about man and his spirit okay it is one united being one person two aspects of a person's being but when you talk about God suddenly we step out of reality, we step into something, something different and strange, and now we are no longer talking about one being with two different aspects of his personality, but now we are talking about two different individual beings. And yet, this is not what the Bible teaches. In Matthew 10, verses 19 and 20, Jesus says very clearly, but when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak. For it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. Listen now. For it is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. Now, I find that so interesting because, you know, People speak of the people who believe in a trinity will refer to the Holy Spirit in this way. They say, God the Spirit. God the Father and God the Spirit. But here you find that Jesus, Jesus clearly, incontrovertibly, explained that the Spirit is the property of somebody. The Spirit belongs to the Father. It is not you that speak, it is the Spirit of your Father. Not the Spirit of God, in case you want to apply that in a Trinitarian way. Not God the Spirit, but the Spirit that belongs to your Father. That is what will speak in you. The mind of the Father will speak through you. God's characteristics will be displayed through you. God's ideas will come through you when you are brought before kings and rulers. That's what Jesus was saying. And the, the Bible, over and over, Psalm 51 and verse 11, David said, Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. The Spirit of the Father, the Spirit of God, is actually the presence of God. In John 15 and verse 26, Jesus says, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Now, now this is something that really is so plain it's difficult to misunderstand jesus says that the holy spirit is something that proceeds from the father now if the holy spirit were an independent separate being from the father how could it be that the spirit could be said to proceed from the father 
all the time he, the, the Spirit proceedeth from the Father. This is not the terminology we would expect if we were talking about a separate person. You, he, Jesus could say the Father will send the Spirit. Let us say that the Spirit were subordinate to the Father. But to say that the Spirit proceeds from the Father. This makes it clear that we are talking about not a separate entity, but something that actually comes out of, from the Father. You know, a little thinking, a little thought will make it plain to us the relationship between God and His Spirit. In actual fact, when you think about human beings, the true identity of a person is really His Spirit. My body is going to perish one day. These lines on my face, this hair that is graying, these fingers that are so crooked, this body that is so dwarfed, one day I will lose this, I will shed it. The new body may have some resemblance to this one, but it will not be this body. It will be different. This is not my identity. My true identity, the thing that will be preserved unto eternity, when the body goes, one part will remain. And this part of me is what is really me. This identity is my spirit. That's what I am. That's who I am. And God's identity is his spirit. And this is why we are told in, in, in John 4 and verse 24 that God is a spirit. God is a spirit. You see, in, in, in Jeremiah 23 and verse 24, God says that he fills heaven and earth. And I want us to just think about that. God claims to fill heaven and earth. Solomon himself asked the question, the heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, much less this house that I am building for you. You see, the point is, God is a being that fills the universe according to the Bible. But just give this a little thought. Is it God's body that fills the universe? Is, is God really sitting on a throne someplace in a place called heaven? Is God's bodily form sitting on a throne? Does he have hands, feet, hair, eyes? Well, if we are to believe the Bible, he does. Yet the Bible says that he fills heaven and earth. How does he fill heaven and earth? Clearly, this does not mean that his hand is way over there in Orion and his feet are way down here upon the earth physically. No, what the Bible is trying to tell us that God in his spiritual form fills the universe. God's mind, God's presence is in every place in the universe. There's no place you can go where God is not there. His spirit, his presence fills the universe. And that is why David says, whither shall I go from thy presence and where shall I flee from thy spirit? God's spirit is actually God's presence in a non-bodily form. In 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 11, Paul says, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. You see, Right here, Paul is comparing man's spirit to God's spirit. He's saying that man's spirit is related to man in the same way that God's spirit is related to God. Nobody knows what is inside of me except my spirit. I am the only person who knows my internal thoughts, who knows what is going on inside of me. There are many people who might think, I'm a nice guy. I'm a Christian person. But the only person who knows for sure is me, myself. Not even my wife, the closest person on earth to me, can be absolutely certain of what goes on inside here. But my spirit knows. And here, God's spirit speaking through the Apostle Paul says that God's spirit relates to God in the same way. God's spirit knows what is inside of God. Again, you can't escape the parallel. Man's spirit, man and his spirit are not two distinct separate beings. There are two aspects of one personality. In the same way, God and His Spirit are not two distinct separate beings, but they are two aspects of one person. In the book, 
Maranatha, on page 301, Ellen White states, Our personal identity is preserved in the resurrection, though not the same particles of matter or material substance as went into the grave. And this is what I was trying to say a little earlier on. The same body does not come back. Those particles of matter have nothing to do with the new body. That is something completely new from new substances, new particles. If it is made up of particles, because we don't quite know exactly what the resurrection body will be like. It will be something called a spiritual body. Perhaps not even made up of the same kind of matter that we know here. But Ellen White says it is not made up of the same particles of matter or material substance. She continues, The wonder works of God are a mystery to man. The spirit, the character of man is returned to God, there to be preserved. In the resurrection, every man will have his own character. God in his own time will call forth the dead, giving again the breath of life and bidding the dry bones live. The same form will come forth, but it will be free from disease and every defect. It lives again, bearing the same individuality of features, so that friend will recognize friend. There is no law of God in nature which shows that God gives back the same identical particles of matter which composed the body before death. God shall give the righteous dead a body that will please him. And this is the point that we have been making. Man's body goes, but his spirit remains. The spirit is the true identity of a person. And this is illustrated in several other places. When Jesus died, in Luke 23, 46, it, it says that he cried, Father, into thy hand I commend my spirit. He was not concerned about his body, but there was some part of Jesus, his spirit, which he commended to his father. In other words, Father, keep my spirit. I trust my spirit in your care, whatever is happening to my body. In Acts 7 and verse, verse 59, Stephen says almost the same thing. It says, and they stoned Stephen calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Again, you see the clear understanding that there was some part of Stephen that was going to be preserved by God. And that is what he was concerned about. So we see that as man's spirit is his identity, so God's spirit is God's identity. But some might ask the question, why is it that the spirit is given personal attributes? Why is it that the spirit seem, is often mentioned as pleading, or as being grieved, you know, some, I, I have spoken to people who have really made a big point about that, that the Holy Spirit is, is given the attributes, the qualities of a person. The Spirit is grieved, the, the Spirit pleads, the Spirit is, is, is angry, and, and clearly we can see that the Spirit has personal attributes. Well, this is not very difficult, again, if we use a little common sense and we look at what the scripture says. In the book of Daniel, we find something happening to King Nebuchadnezzar that is not hard to understand. And when it is related to a human being, we don't find it difficult to understand. And I don't think, from what we have looked at so far, God's spirit is related to God in the same way man's spirit relates to man. So let us look at what happened to Nebuchadnezzar, and this will help us to understand. In Daniel 2 and verse 1, it says, In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled, and his sleep break from him. Now just think about what that says. It says Nebuchadnezzar's spirit was troubled. Did it mean that Nebuchadnezzar's knees were knocking together? Did it mean that Nebuchadnezzar broke out in a fever and a sweat? Not necessarily. What it says is that his 
spirit was troubled. Something inside of Nebuchadnezzar was grieved. It was not his body that was troubled. It was his mind. It's not difficult to understand. I mean, would we, would we deduce from this? Would we conclude from this that somebody besides Nebuchadnezzar was troubled? Somebody besides Nebuchadnezzar, some other being just like Nebuchadnezzar, was concerned? No, we know it's talking about Nebuchadnezzar, but it's talking about Nebuchadnezzar on an internal level. And yet when the same thing is said about God's spirit, all of a sudden our minds take a quantum leap and we conclude it is somebody different from God. This does not make sense. Ellen White also explains how the Holy Spirit pleads. You know, in, 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 in Romans chapter 8 we are told that the spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And again, people say, this, the Spirit groans. You see, the Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit intercedes with God. So the Holy Spirit is a separate person. Interestingly, some versions of the Bible add some clarification to this verse by translating it in this way. The Holy Spirit makes intercession through our groanings unutterable which carries the idea that it is not the Holy Spirit who groans, but that it is we who groan as the Holy Spirit impresses us or, or impels us to cry to God. And Ellen White supports this idea. Listen to what she says in Christ's Object Lessons on page 147. We must not only pray in Christ's name, but by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This explains what is meant when it is said that the Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Romans 8 verse 26. Such prayer God delights to answer. When with earnestness and intensity we breathe a prayer in the name of Christ, there is in that very intensity a pledge from God that He is about to answer our prayer exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Here you see Ellen White supports the idea that the, the pleading of the Holy Spirit is not one God going before another God and begging him, verbally speaking to that person. But what she says is that the Spirit of God, God's own personality in us, draws prayers out of us. Again, in the Review and Herald of February 9, 1897, she says, we have only one channel of approach to God. Our prayers can come to Him through one name only, that of the Lord Jesus, our Advocate. His Spirit must inspire our petitions. No strange fire was to be used in the censers that were waved before God in His sanctuary. So the Lord Himself must kindle in our hearts the burning desire if our prayers are acceptable to Him. The Holy Spirit within must make intercessions for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. And that is so plain, I don't think it is possible for us to misunderstand what that is saying. I'll read one more quote from Selected Messages, Book 1, page 344. It says, Christ our mediator and the Holy Spirit are constantly interceding in man's behalf. But the Spirit pleads not for us as does Christ, who presents his blood shed from the foundation of the world. The Spirit works upon our hearts, drawing out prayers and penitence, praise and thanksgiving. The gratitude which flows from our lips is the result of the spirits striking the chords of the soul in holy memories, awakening the music of the heart. So it is plain, brothers and sisters, that the pleading of the Holy Spirit is not one person verbally speaking to another person. But what it really means is that the Spirit works upon our hearts and causes us to groan to God, to cry to God, the Spirit inspires how we pray, and so the Spirit intercedes with God through our prayers by giving us the, the true feelings of prayer. You know, I, I don't know 
if you have ever been at the place where you felt so deeply about something that you could not find the words to speak. You come before God to pray and all that you can say is, mm. you can only groan, you can't think of the words to say. It is the Spirit of God in you who is inspiring that deep feeling, deeper than words can express. And yet, God knows the mind of His Spirit. God knows what He's doing inside of you. And so that groan becomes a prayer that God hears and answers. That, brothers and sisters, is a simple explanation of the reason why the Spirit is given these attributes. Being grieved, pleading. Because the Spirit is God Himself, the spiritual form of God Himself. And God has feelings, all of these attributes God has. So there's no mystery about it, really. It is through this Spirit that God comes to us and is with us. God's life is imparted to us through His Son. And this relationship is brought out in several verses, but I want to focus on a few. In John 14 and verse 10, Jesus says, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Now just pause a moment before we move on from this verse. Jesus says, my Father lives in me. And he does these works in me. He does not say the Holy Spirit is in me. He does not say the third person of the Godhead is in me. He says the Father dwells in me. And the Father does these works in me. How does the Father live in Jesus? Or when he was a man, how did the Father live in Jesus? Was this a, a, a real relationship or was this figurative language. Was it really true that God himself personally lived inside his son? How did this happen? How was it possible? Once we understand the nature of the Holy Spirit, it's not difficult to understand. God's personality, God's mind, God's non-bodily form can live inside of people. God was in his son in this way. You know, we have, we have read in the Bible many places where, where people became demon-possessed, where they were possessed by a devil. And Jesus, in many places, cast out these devils. And you can tell that somehow, in some way, these evil spirits actually came to live inside of the bodies of these people. Now, this was by compulsion. This was not voluntary on the part of the people. These evil spirits would take over their voices and speak in the voice of demons. And the words that came from their mouths were actually the words of Satan or his agents. So you know that a spirit can live inside another person. Yet the spirit is, is actually a demon. In the same way or in a similar way, God himself can live inside of us in his spiritual form. You know God never forces people. And yet if we choose, if we voluntary choo voluntarily choose to allow God to live in us, God himself can live inside of us. And this is how God lived inside of his son Jesus Christ. This explains what, what the Bible means in Ephesians 3 and verse 9 when it says, God created all things by Jesus Christ. It was the Father living in the Son who was working through his Son in doing these things. Hebrews 1 and verse 2 where it says that God hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. That verse ends by saying, by whom also he made the worlds. God made the worlds through his Son. But this is only possible if it was God himself living in his Son and working through his Son. But this relationship does not end with God living in his Son. Praise God. And this Brothers and sisters, I think is the most critical truth that comes out in this discussion. What we're about to look at now. Because the truth is that God's life, God himself, comes to us through his son. I had problems when I began to understand this. I had problems with the doctrine of the Trinity. I had problems with the idea that the Holy Spirit is a third separate entity. And before I read 
a couple of verses for you. I just want to say, the doctrine of the Trinity teaches, uh, at least I've discussed this with, some, with, with many people, many Trinitarians, and when we look at the doctrine, what it really teaches is that God himself, personally, and that Jesus himself, personally, do not have personal con contact with me. The Bible teaches that it is the Spirit of God that lives in us. And yet, if the Spirit of God is a different person from the Father and the Son, is it really true that God the Father is with me and that Jesus is with me? This is a very serious question because Jesus has made many promises and later on I'll read just a couple of them. But this is why it is important. It comes down to the fundamental question of whether or not as Christians we have true fellowship with the Father and His Son. And Jesus tried to make this matter so clear over and over again. In John 17 verses 22 and 23, Jesus says, And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. And that's very clear. Jesus says that the way that the, the relationship of God to his people is like this. The Father is in the Son, and the Son is in us. If Jesus is in us, then clearly what we have is the presence of both Father and Son because the Father dwells in His Son. That's what Jesus says. We have true fellowship with Father and Son. And Ellen White comments on this in The Desire of Ages and clarifies that verse in a beautiful way. On, on page 21 she says, All things Christ received from God but he took to give. So in the heavenly courts, in his ministry for all created beings, through the beloved Son, the Father's life flows out to all. The Father's life, she says. It is the life of the Father, the Spirit of the Father that flows through the Son. Continuing, it says, through the Son it returns in praise and joy of service, a tide of love to the great source of all. And thus, through Christ, the circuit of beneficence is complete, representing the character of the great giver, the law of life. That's a beautiful passage. It explains so clearly what the relationship of the Christian is to God and to his Son. They are with us. We have contact, brothers and sisters. We are not orphans. We are not left alone. Jesus is not billions of light years away. He, 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 he promised to be with his people and he kept his promise. It is not the presence of another, but actually of Father and Son who, which is with us. I want us to just examine what Jesus said in a couple of places in John 14 because this confuses some people. In, in verses 16 to 18 of John 14, listen to what Jesus says. He says, I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter. That is what sounds conclusive to some people who say the Holy Spirit is a separate person. Jesus continues, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. An interesting passage because Jesus says two things there which seem to contradict each other. First of all, he says, I'm sending you another comforter. Then he says at the end, I will come to you. You have a question. What did he mean? Did he mean somebody else is coming or did he mean I am coming? Right in the middle he says that the world cannot receive this comforter because it does not see him and it does not know him. But he says, you know him because he lives with you and will be in you. 
does that begin to clarify the situation? Does it begin to clarify the question of who this other comforter is and why Jesus refers to, to, to the Holy Spirit as another comforter? Let's read another verse that will add even a little more light. John 14 and verse 28, Jesus says, You have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again. And come again unto you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said I go unto my father, for my father is greater than I. Here he does not say I'm sending another comforter. He says I am going away and coming again. Which seems to make it clear that the Holy Spirit is actually Christ himself coming back. But the question is, if, if Jesus was coming back, why did he speak of this Holy Spirit as another comforter? Well, he makes it clear. He says, he says the, the world cannot receive him because the world does not see him and does not know him. Does the world know or recognize the Holy Spirit? When God is speaking to people's hearts, knocking on their hearts' door, speaking in their ears, does the world, do the people of the world recognize that it is God speaking? That is what Jesus meant. The world did not know the Holy Spirit. And yet Jesus was not coming back. If, if he had come back in his bodily form, the world would have known him. But he was coming back in a form where his disciples would recognize that it was Christ himself, but the world would not know him. And if you read John chapter 14 very carefully, you'll see that this is brought out very, very clearly, beyond controversy. You see, that the question is, who is really with us? Is it Christ or is it another? Jesus promised in so many places. He himself promised and then through his disciples he promised that he was going to have true fellowship with us. And I don't know how it could be said any more clearly than John tried to say it in 1 John 1 and verse 3. John said, you know he begins that chapter by saying, we have seen, we have felt, we have touched the word of life. And then in verse 3 he says, That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you. That you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. I mean, it's difficult to fathom what he's trying to say. Why does he say, truly? What is he trying to do? When do you use the word truly? You know, you say to somebody, I'm trying to tell you something. Truly, man, what are you trying to do? You are trying to convict the person that what you are saying is absolute truth. John said, I'm writing this letter because I want you to have something. I want you to have fellowship, the same fellowship that we are having. And I want you to know truly we have fellowship with the Father and His Son. Not with a third personality. Not with a third being but truly with God himself and his Son, through the Spirit of God, living in the Son and coming to us, to live in us. Again in John 14, verses 22 and 23, Judas said unto him, not Iscariot, not Judas Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? And let me just break to say that you can see that the disciples understood. When Jesus said, I'm sending another comforter, they understood that he meant he himself was coming back. He was coming back in another form. Judah says, Lord, how, how is this going to happen? How are you going to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and we, my father and I, we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. That is how you are going to see me, and the world is not going to see me. Ellen White also makes a comment which is very enlightening. In manuscript release number 1084, she says, Cumbered with humanity, Christ could not be in every place personally. Therefore, it was altogether for their advantage that he should leave them to go to his father, and send the Holy Spirit to be his successor on earth. Now, now, notice Ellen White says the same thing that Jesus says. He was going to send the Holy Spirit to be his successor. He was going to send another comforter. But then she, she continues by saying exactly what Jesus says next. She says the Holy Spirit is himself. 
divested of, pers of the personality of humanity and independent thereof. He would represent himself as present in all places by his Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit is Jesus himself, she says, but divested of the personality of humanity. You have got to ask the question, if the Holy Spirit was not Jesus himself, how could the Holy Spirit be divested of personality when it had never had human personality? To be divested of something, you, you need to have had it first of all. She says the Holy Spirit is Jesus himself, divested of the personality of humanity. And that is exactly what Jesus says. Ephesians 2 and verse 18 tells us that through him, through Jesus, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Again, the relationship is brought out very clearly. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 17 tells us that the Lord is that spirit. Jesus is that spirit. When the spirit comes to us, it is the presence of Jesus. It is the Father's spirit through Christ living in us. Just by the way, it is interesting to note that the Catholics believe that they can find the presence of Jesus in a piece of bread. They believe that they partake of Christ by eating of the communion wafer in the Eucharist. And I find that very interesting. And yet it seems to me to be a logical step for Catholicism. You know the Catholics have claimed that all their doctrines are based on the doctrine of the Trinity. They have said in, in, in in many of their writings, that the doctrine of the Trinity is a central pillar of Catholic faith. In the handbook for today's Catholic on page 16, they have stated this. And they say, all our doctrines are based on this doctrine. And now when you look at the fact that Catholics find Christ's presence in a piece of bread, it seems logical. Because the Holy Spirit to a Trinitarian is not the presence of Christ. It is just simply somebody acting like Christ, somebody being a substitute for Christ. To find Christ, if it is to be Christ himself, you have to find some other means. So the Catholics create him in a piece of bread and partake of him by eating that bread in what some people have described as a cannibalistic ritual. But that's logical, it seems logical, because there is no other way that they can find Christ, because they have created a substitute. And that's something that bears thinking about. But Jesus promised that he would never leave us. In Matthew 28 and verse 20, in that last commission that he gave to the, to the disciples, he promises, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. In Hebrews 13 and verse 5, he says that, Paul tells us, he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And so, brothers and sisters, we know that we have true fellowship with the Father and the Son. Today, we find that people are worshipping the Holy Spirit, are praying to the Holy Spirit. If what I have said on this tape is true, you can see the implications of that. People are praying and worshipping, praying to and worshipping a being that does not exist what does the Bible call that? This is idolatry. It is false worship. It is it, no concept of God that is untrue can glorify God. And therefore, this issue is not an unimportant one. As we have seen also, nobody can appreciate the privilege that we have of fellowship with the Father and His Son unless we understand who, what the Holy Spirit is. There is much more that could be said on this subject, but I'm going to stop here with the hope and with the prayer that by God's grace, what I have said here has been enough to stimulate you to read, read and study a little more closely. You will find that this is the teaching of the Holy Scriptures. And as you study, you'll find that you will find avenues open before you for closer fellowship with the Father and with His Son. And this truly as Jesus said, is life eternal, that they might know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. God bless you, brothers and sisters. I trust that this tape has been a blessing. And I pray that that spirit of truth 
will continue to guide you into all truth. God bless you. Oh